Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to one another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. For a few moments, with the help of the Lord, I want to talk to you from the subject, Seeking the Presence of God in Times of Crisis. Seeking the Presence of God in Times of Crisis. Without a doubt, we are living in times of crisis. Our world is in crisis. There are wars, economic instability, violence, false religion, political upheaval, and a fear of the future. Our families and our marriages are under attack. Parents are overwhelmed, overworked, stressed out, simply trying to balance family work and everyday life. Our mental and emotional health is under attack. We're battling with depression and anxiety and fear like never before. And the list goes on and on. I don't think the question is so much, are we in a time of crisis? But I think the true question today would be, what are we to do in this time of crisis? Unfortunately, today there are many who are giving in to the pressures of this time. Simply just complaining constantly about their current situation. Blaming others and ultimately becoming resentful for the things that are coming against them. But can I tell you? However, when you come into the presence of God, something tremendously different happens. You discover that his presence has the power to not only change your current circumstances, but is powerful enough to change you and your perspective in those very same circumstances. Are there any witnesses of this in the building here today? And so I invite you today to begin to seek the presence of God. His presence can make all the difference in your life. It's not that we're ignoring the current crisis that we find ourselves in today. It's that we understand that we can invite God into our situation and things begin to change. When God shows up and his presence fills your life, everything begins to change. What was Dark, all of a sudden becomes to get bright again. What was empty all of a sudden becomes filled. How does that happen? By the very presence of our God. Because when God shows up, fear has to leave. In other words, there's no longer room for fear because God's presence has filled our lives. When God shows up, darkness and confusion have to go. There's no longer any room for anxiety, depression, and bitterness. His presence comes and fills the emptiness and overcomes the hopelessness that has plagued our life. His presence is what makes the difference. And that is why I'm encouraging you today, dear friend and brother, to seek his presence. Draw closer to God. Make up in your mind that you want God in your life. That you need God in your family. That you need God in your home. And when you invite Jesus in to that current crisis that you find yourself in today, everything will change. In times of crisis, my dear brother and friend, we must seek 
the Lord. We must seek after his presence. If we return to our text in Isaiah chapter 6, it was in the year of, 70, of 704 B.C. It was a crisis moment for Isaiah and the people of God. Their king, King Uzziah, had just died. Imagine the leader of that known time of the people of God had suddenly passed away. It ushered in a national crisis for the people of Israel, especially for their prophet, Isaiah, because Uzziah the king had become a confidant and friend and personal connection to the prophet Isaiah. But the Bible says that it was in that same year of crisis, it was in that same year of difficulty that the prophet Isaiah had a powerful encounter with God. How many of you know that in the darkest moments of your life, you can encounter God in a great way? And it was the same for Isaiah. It was a national crisis that had plagued God's people. And Isaiah, in a very personal way, some were losing their king and the prophet was losing his friend. And in that same year, God showed up in Isaiah's life and changed Isaiah forever. And so today, I want us to see what can happen in your and my life when we seek the presence of God in times of crisis. The first thing that I want us to look at today, number one, that there is a manifestation of God's presence in a time of crisis. Someone say God's presence. Let's go back to verse number one of Isaiah chapter six. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe, verse number one says, filled the temple. For the prophet Isaiah, this was a year marked by crisis. King Uzziah had died, but I love Isaiah's response to this crisis moment. What does Isaiah do? He's lost his friend. He's devastated. And as a prophet of God that was concerned for the people of God, he could see the sadness, the devastation, the pain in the eyes and in the hearts of people. So what does Isaiah do? He goes to the temple. Someone say he goes to the temple. Isaiah, why don't you just go and bury yourself at home and close the window shades and turn off all the lights and put the saddest music on that you can find and say, it's over. What are we going to do now? I've never hurt this much before. I never felt so much pain. And yes, pain is real. And yes, we do mourn. And yes, we do hurt. But can I tell you, in those moments of pain, in those moments of mourning, in those moments of difficulty, you got to make up in your mind, I got to get into the presence of God. I got to find God however I can. If I have to cry out to him, I'll cry out to him. If my prayer turns into mumbling words, it doesn't matter, but in the middle of my pain, I'm going to seek his presence. He goes to the temple. He says, I'm going to church. And I'm going to get in God's presence. Because there's a lot of things that I don't know. But one thing I do know, I feel better when I'm in his presence. There's a lot of things that I can't explain. There's a lot of answers that I'll never get in this life. But one thing I do know, when I step into the presence of God, all of a sudden, eh, the worry goes and, and the pain begins to subside. And I begin to see clearly that God is with me, that he loves me, and he'll never leave me. I'm talking to somebody here today. It's not time to hide yourself away. If you find yourself in a crisis, it's time to get into the presence of God. He doesn't run and hide. He doesn't disconnect himself from God. He goes to the temple. He says, he saw this, he lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He was there. He goes to the temple to seek the presence of God. And guess what happens? God shows up. 
You know what I believe? I believe that if somebody makes up in their mind, I'm going to go into God's presence and I'm going to seek him. I believe God already begins to show up. I believe God makes it a priority to meet us in those moments of our greatest crisis if it's in our heart to seek the Lord. I'm so glad somebody woke up this morning and said, I'm going to get to God's house because I know if I show up, he'll show up. I know if I reach out to him, he'll reach down to me. There's power when you make up in your mind, I'm going to go into his presence. When you seek the Lord, he'll show up. This teaches us that in our moment of crisis, we need to seek the presence of God. And we have a promise that if we do just that, God will meet us in our time of crisis. But there is another blessing in seeking God in times of crisis. Let me give this to you. It should be on the screen. Seeking the presence of God will cause me to see God sitting on his throne. So Isaiah says, I can't stay home. I can't disconnect. I can't fall away from God. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. There's a national crisis. What are we going to do? We're going to seek the Lord. So he goes to God's house, begins to seek the presence of God. God shows up. And then guess what happens? Go back to verse number one. He, sa uh, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Somebody say sitting on the throne. What does all of this mean? In his moment of seeking God, Isaiah got a revelation and he saw God sitting high up on his throne. This is why seeking God in our difficult moments is so important because you will get a revelation of God sitting high on the throne, meaning that God is in complete control of your situation and is high above the difficulty you might be facing. If Isaiah would have stayed home and felt sorry for himself, he would have buried himself farther in discouragement, farther in depression, farther in desperation. But because he made up his mind to seek the Lord, he got a revelation and he said, I see him high and lifted up. It's sitting on a throne. And that tells me that everything is going to be all right. I don't know all that's going on in this world. And I'm not quite sure all that's coming here real soon. But I do know one thing. He's high and lifted up and sitting on the throne as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you rob yourself of that revelation when you decide the best thing to do is to feel sorry for yourself. And this is where people begin to disconnect and distance themselves from normal things. Yes, pain and hurt that we all experience. And tragedies and difficulties and health issues and family drama, financial crisis. All those things hit all of us. But it's not so much that it comes to you. It's what you do when it comes to you. And Isaiah said, I'm going to seek the presence of God. And in his seeking, he saw the Lord high and lifted. My prayer here today is that before this service is over, someone sees him high and lifted up. I may be in a low valley, but I see him high and lifted up, sitting on the throne. That leads me to believe that my family is going to be all right, that my future is secure in him, that everything is going to work out because God is on the throne. There's all kinds of folks worried. It's 2024, Pastor. It's an election year. What are we going to do? Which side are we going to take? There's only one side. And that's the Lord's side. And when the people of Israel got confused, the Lord through his servants said, who is on the Lord's side? 
And I just feel like there's some apostolic believers and some Christian folk in our community that has forgotten there isn't two sides. It's not about the left or the right. It's about being on the Lord's side. And can I just tell you, November will come and go and it won't matter who will be in the White House as long as we know who's on the throne. So get some sleep, turn off the television and say, as long as he's high and lifted up, this church is going to go forward. The people of God are going to march forward because he's on the throne. Look at somebody, tell them God's on the throne. You see, but, but, but before seeking God, all I could see was my problems. Before seeking God, all I could see was my pain. But now I see him high and lifted up. Sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning over my life. Another thing that happens is that God's presence brings peace. Someone say peace. In the middle of your crisis. This encounter that the prophet Isaiah had, it settled his heart and brought peace. You see, when God shows up, he always brings peace. Let me give you a biblical example here in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse number 19, read with me. This is powerful. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled. In other words, you have to understand, Jesus had just been crucified. And there was a belief that they were then going to crucify every single one of his followers and disciples. Or at the very least, they were persecuting them and they were after them. So when Jesus was led away, the disciples went and hid. They found a place. They shut themselves away. They shut the door. Look what it says. For fear of the Jews. Because they said, we're next. Jesus could handle that crucifixion, but we can't. So they went and hid. For fear of the Jews. And while they were afraid, while they were hiding, while they were escaping for their life, Jesus came and says, and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And all of a sudden the fear left. And the worry about what's going to happen to us and, and are we next and, 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 and all these insecurities that they were dealing with it shut in there in that room. When Jesus showed up, he brought peace. How? Because he's the prince of peace. What am I trying to tell you? Peace always follows God's presence. So if you've walked into this building with confusion in your life, if you've walked in here feeling uneasy and not knowing which step to take, you need God's presence because behind that presence comes the peace that passes all understanding. God revealed himself to Isaiah, filling him with peace. Can I tell you, friend and brother, God's presence is available to you today, waiting to fill you and cover you with peace. Seek his presence today in the midst of your crisis. There will be a manifestation of God's presence in the midst of your crisis if you will seek him. What do you see right now in your crisis? What do you see right now in the middle of your difficulty? At eye level and ground level, all Isaiah could see was chaos. At ground level, all Isaiah could see was pain and heartache in the middle of God's people. But in his pursuit of the presence of God, God revealed himself to Isaiah, transforming his situation. Look at verses 2 through 4 with me of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says, Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to one another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Ground level, chaos. Eye level, confusion and heartache. So Isaiah goes into God's presence. And now he sees that God was holy. Not only is he high and lifted up, not only does he sit on the throne, but he is a holy God. 
that the angels weren't taught what to say. The angels weren't given a script. The angels weren't told, okay, every 30 minutes, this is what you're going to say. No, the angels that encircled the throne, it just automatically came out of them. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. The Bible says that they said to one another, he's holy. And he's mighty, even in the midst of the worst circumstances. Can I tell you, friend and brother, no matter how bad it may seem, God is holy. No, how, no matter how dark it may look, God is mighty. God is powerful. Your crisis does not determine who God is and what kind of power he has. Don't forget that our God is holy and our God is mighty. And I love this because here's Isaiah, ground level chaos. He looks into God's presence. He looks into the holy of holies and he sees the holiness of God. He sees the might of God. And then the angels cry, holy, holy. Verse number three, the, the, the Lord of hosts. Someone say the Lord of hosts. Why does that matter? Why is that important? Because not only do you see him holy and mighty, but he saw him as the Lord of hosts. In other words, he is the Lord who fights our battles. The word hosts is a military term for a host of soldiers, a host of armies. And so when the angels cry that he's the Lord of hosts, that means that there are angelic forces waiting to be impatched to battle and fight on behalf of God's people. Can I tell you, God is fighting for us. And if God is fighting for us, we will win. Oh, yes, he's holy. Oh, yes, he's mighty. But he's the one that fights our battles. The Lord of hosts, the angels declared the whole earth was full of his glory. And then the entire temple filled with smoke. That smoke was a manifestation of the visible presence of God. It was the Shekinah that guided Moses in the desert. It was the glory of God that filled the temple in the days of Solomon. And today God is saying that he wants to fill your life. He wants to fill your house with his glory. With his manifested presence. If you seek him, my dear brother and friend, he will fill your life with his glory. And this is the very reason why we are seeking God in this month of consecration. We want God to visit us with his glory. And as was mentioned a little bit ago by our co-pastor on Thursday, we had dismissed Bible study. We had fellowship for a little bit. And we walked into the, to the fellowship hall and our young people were still in the presence of God, speaking in tongues and rejoicing. There was no music. There was no singing. There was no preaching. It was just glory. For about an hour after Everything was over. There were still young people getting a hold of God, being touched by God, being filled with the glory of God. It wasn't something that had been orchestrated. It wasn't something that had been manufactured. God used Evangelist Mingo Garcia to declare a word of consecration. And the young people responded and God showed up. I'm here to tell you that's what God desires to do in this hour. That's why we're seeking him. That's why we want his prayer. We want to see his glory. Is there anybody here that wants to see the glory of God? We want his glory more than anything else. So PFAC, let's set ourselves to seek God like never before. Because we have this great promise in these last days. Haggai chapter 2 and verse number 9. It says the glory of this latter temple will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. God's reserved a greater glory for this hour. God has reserved a greater visitation of his spirit and his presence for his people in this hour. But it's time for us to seek these things with all of our hearts. It's time to pursue his presence. And so Isaiah, in a moment of crisis, seeks the presence of God and God shows up and he experiences God's manifest presence. The second thing that 
I want us to see is that there is a total surrender, number two, in a time of crisis. Someone say surrender. You have the presence of God, and now you begin to have Isaiah's response to the presence of God, which was then there was a surrender. You see, when God truly shows up in your life, your response, my response, should be to surrender. To give up. Say, Lord, I'm tired of running. There's some of us that have been running from God for so long that we're just used to running. We'll just avoid God's presence, avoid God's people, avoid God's house. We're just running, running, running. But I'm talking to somebody that's been running for a while. It's time for you to say, God, I give up. I'm done running. I'm done hiding. I'm done trying to pretend that I don't hear God's voice and I don't see him. I know he's calling me. I know he's reaching me. I can feel that conviction inside of me. And so, Lord, I'll surrender. And that was Isaiah's response. He surrendered. Look at verse number five with me. Isaiah chapter six. So Isaiah is telling the story here. He says, so I said, woe is me. For I am undone. Another version says, I'm like a dead man. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. I want you to notice that and remember that. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What am I trying to say here? Seeking the presence of God will lead you to surrender some things. You can put that on the screen for me. As you're pursuing God and you find his presence... It's going to cause you to surrender some things to him. There are things, let me just put it this way. There are things that we still need to surrender to God. Well, pastor, you know, I already got baptized. I already became a member of this church. I signed the dotted line. I'm good to go. Secure Give app is the first app on my phone. I'm good. I'm in. What else do you guys want? Can I tell you that no matter how much or how long we've been here and been doing this, I promise you there are still things in you and in me that need to be surrendered. Let's go a little bit deeper. This is going to get good here in a second. Many times, surrendering our lives to God is a process. How many of you know it's a process? We begin by surrendering certain aspects of our lives. God begins to take our mind and our attention. Even part of our time. As we get more committed, we even give God of our finances. But there may still be other areas of our life that have still not yet been surrendered completely to the Lord. And it's in these moments in God's presence, as we're seeking him, that we begin to see the need to surrender those things. Somebody say those things. What are those things? It's those things that you don't want anybody to see. It's those things that we hide that we're not quite ready to give up. It's those things that that if we don't surrender, we continue to end up stumbling up on them. We all have those things. Look at your neighbor real quick and tell him, those things. Come on, tell them those things. Why? Why? Because as I was saying this, those things came to their mind. They said, oh, yeah. Those things. These things, those things. I wish you had Bible for that preacher. I, have a, I definitely do. Here it goes. I'm a Bible preacher, so I preach from the Bible. Isaiah was a prophet. He was a prophet of God, all right? He's seeking the presence of God. He is a spiritual guy. He's seeking God's presence. And while he's seeking God's presence, he realizes, I have those things that I still haven't surrendered. Isaiah's in God's presence. He's probably crying. He's probably shaking. He's doing that apostolic hokey pokey. 
I mean, he's, he's got it down. He knows where the church is. He knows how to walk in the front door. He knows everybody on his way in. He greeted everybody on his way in. He greeted everybody on his way out. He's probably got the card-carrying member of that church. I mean, he's got it down pat, and he's in God's presence. He's doing the apostolic hokey-pokey. He's already done his jig. He's already sang the words. He don't even need the words on the screen. He already knows them. And he's in God's presence. And when God's presence hits his life, he says, there's one thing I still need to surrender. But Isaiah, you're a prophet. You were born and raised in the church, Isaiah. I thought you were holy already. Well, he's making me holy. But I'm not there yet. There's still some things that I need to surrender. And so go back to verse number six. This is powerful. You got to get this. You can't miss this. Isaiah's in God's presence and he says, uh, woe is me. Verse number six. He says, woe is me for I'm, I'm done. Uh, verse, verse five, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Verse number five. He says, woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of what? He had one of those things. He still struggled with his lips. You're saved, but you still struggle with these lips. You're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're a card-carrying member. You don't need the words on the screen. You already know them. Like Isaiah, you can greet everybody on your way in, and you can greet everybody on your way out. But Isaiah was real enough with God. He said, there's still an area of my life that I haven't fully surrendered. God, you already know it, but I need to confess it. It's these unclean lips. Somebody gets in front of me on the highway, and then these things just come out. Somebody gets under my skin, and I just don't hold back. I just got to let them have it. Somebody challenges me, and I just can't keep quiet. And so, God, in the middle of your glory, in the middle of your presence, I need to surrender this one thing here. I'm a man of unclean lips. Somebody's not clapping because you know that's not what you struggle with. Well, Pastor, I don't struggle with my lips. Yeah, but you struggle with your mind. Oh, you preach it to them, Pastor. Those that can't control their lips, but you can't control your thoughts. You tell them, Pastor, those people that speak unkind things, they're already in your mind and in your heart. But there's other things that you got that you need to surrender. There's other areas of your life that you've been coming to church with and dragging back and forth day after day, week after month, habits and attitudes and things that you refuse to let go of. But when God's presence shows up, you got to get real with God and say, Lord, there's still something that I need to surrender. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's why we're seeking God's presence this month. In hope and prayer that there's some things that we surrender that we still haven't surrendered yet. But I love this. Go back to verse number five. This is awesome. This is, I wasn't going to add this, but this is just extra. He says, woe is me. Not woe is you. There's a lot of folks that when we start talking about change, they start saying, yep, that's right, she needs to change. Yep. Are, are you listening to the pastor? He's preaching to you. I'm sharing it right now because sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so and my cousin and my family, they need to hear this message because they need to change. I'm going to tag my spouse in the comments because, man, they need to change. But change. Is not for everybody else. Change is for you. <laughs> Isaiah didn't say, woe is all my family. Woe are all my neighbors. Whoa, my co-workers all messed up. Whoa, all my cousins are crazy. I just says, woe is me. I need to change. 
I need to be transformed. There's some things that I need to, before I point the finger at what everybody else needs to fix, God fix me. Oh, I wonder if I had some real folks in the building that said the person in my house that needs to change the most is me. I need to change. I need to be transformed. I need God to make me new. There's some things that I have to repent over. If you can be real with God, could you sleep up your hands in the heavens right now? You know the areas. You know the things. You know the... Change me, Lord. Do a revival in my home and let it start with me. Bring transformation to my family and let it start with me. Change me. Consecration is personal. It's you and God. Well, I'm so glad the pastor called this time of consecration. You folks need it. If you're under the umbrella of this church, you need it too. And the pastor's calling it. You want to know why? Because the pastor needs it too. I need to change some areas of my life. God needs to come in and transform some things in me and all of So it's not woe, it's them. It's woe, it's me. What is it, my dear brother and friend, that you need to surrender? The Bible says, and one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, verse number six, which he had taken with the tongs from his altar. I love this because this is what the Holy Ghost showed me and I got to share it with you. The third thing that I find also here is as you're seeking God, if you can give me that as well, you activate angelic manifestation. And God's been dealing with me about this because this is something that I've experienced over and over and over and over in my life since I was young. The ministry of angels. And we don't speak enough about this, but this is very biblical. This is very much a part of the church. Because in our pursuit of God's presence, we release angels to act on our behalf. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of focus on the ministry of angels. But I can tell you by the Holy Ghost that in this time of consecration, as you pray for your loved ones, as you pray for your family members, as you pray for those people that are in desperate need of God, I tell you by the Holy Ghost, angels are going to be released to minister to you, your family, and your loved ones. It's the, as you seek the presence of God. But that's not going to happen until you seek God. I pray and I always pray Lord send angels with that family member Lord send angels with my children as they go to school as they return when you tell me you're going out of town you know what I do I say Lord send angels with them on their trip to protect them to guard them I believe in the ministry of angels I have felt angelic manifestation I've seen angels I was preaching in a youth camp one time, and the Holy Ghost was, I mean, so powerful. It was, it was glory over all over that service. We were walking out of there at 11 o'clock, almost midnight, when the service started at 7 o'clock. And I walked out of the, I walked out of, uh, the sanctuary, and I saw a bright light right at the, at the edge of the sanctuary. I thought it was a light, you know, because it was nighttime. I thought it was a light that was shining down on the church, you know, kind of there where the entrance was, the sanctuary that they were having services in. And so I kind of did one of those kinds of things. And I'm like, man, the light is bright. And I started walking. And then I turned around, and the light was gone. And I said, what in the world happened? And I walked back to the exact same spot, the exact same place, and there was no light post. There was no light fixture of any kind. But I saw a bright, I mean, it was, it was a big, huge light. And I thought, hey, you know, they put a light for safety. I get it, you know, the entrance of the church. I, it makes sense. But I went back and there was no light. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and told me it was angels. Yeah. 
And I could be here all day. I, could, I mean, I could tell you, and I probably will as we get more into this and as time goes on about our, our, our experience with the ministry of angels. But let me tell you, when you begin to seek God's presence, you activate angelic manifestation. That you can send angels to your family members in other parts of the city, other parts of the country, and other parts of the world. When somebody begins to seek the presence of God, there's angelic manifestation. That sounds real cool for the Old Testament, Pastor, but give me a New Testament example. I'll give you one. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Watch this. Acts 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Verse 2, a devout man. I want you to notice this. And one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. This man was seeking God. This man was in pursuit of God and his presence. And watch what happened. Verse number three. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius? Angels work on behalf of those who set themselves to seek the presence of God. I'm here to tell you in the Holy Ghost that as we continue to seek God like never before, we're going to be releasing ang angels and angelic manifestation all over the city of Phoenix and all over the world. You're going to start hearing testimonies of relatives that said, I almost got in a car accident. I almost got fired. I almost got kicked out of my apartment. I almost got sick. And you're going to say, no, you didn't almost. I sent angels to defend you and protect you. Whether you like it or not, I've been praying for you. As you seek the presence of God, you release angels. To go with you. And angels minister. Angels defend. Angels protect the glory of God. And so when you seek God, you release angelic manifestation. Let me hurry. The, the next thing here, seeking God's presence will bring a transforming touch to your life. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 7, look at what he says. And he touched my mouth, the angel, with it from the tongue of the coal that was off the altar and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Can I tell you, we all need a touch of God. But I'm talking about a touch that brings change and complete transformation to your life. And I believe there are many of us in this room here today that need a touch from God that brings renewing to our spiritual lives. A touch that reorganizes our lives. A touch that causes us to shake some things that, that have attached themselves to our life. A touch that maybe would wake up somebody in this room here today to believe that God has something great and powerful in store for your life. We all need a touch from God. The Lord told Isaiah that his iniquity was taken away and his sin purged. In God's presence, you can experience true freedom and liberty from whatever may be binding you. Did you know that you don't have to be bound anymore? Did you know that you don't have to be addicted to those things anymore? Do you know that you can be free when you step into the presence of God? Because in God's presence, there is transformation. In God's presence, every burden can be lifted from off your shoulder. In God's presence, every chain can be broken and every yoke can be destroyed. All of that is available to you when you step into the presence of God. And I've got good news for somebody in this room today. His presence is in this building. God is in his holy temple. And if you want to walk out of here delivered, you can. If you want to be set free once and for all, you can. Because his presence is here. I've seen God like this set addicts free. I've seen God do in seconds 
what rehabilitation centers can't do in months. It's the power of his presence. It's the power of an encounter. I'm not talking about religion here, my dear brother and friend. I'm not talking about some church building. I'm talking about the presence of God. God himself shows up and you realize, whoa, it's me for I am undone. Jesus, this is the area of my life that I need you to come in and set me free. And guess what happens? God's presence will remove the limitations of your past and wipes away the sins that have held you hostage. As I get ready to close, open your heart to the presence of God. So that you can experience freedom, salvation, and a renewed spiritual life. Let me just say this. The devil can't stop you from drawing closer to God. But there is one thing that creates distance between us and God, and that is our sin. So my dear brother and friend, let God touch you, cleanse you, and purify you. By his transforming power so that you can walk out of here purified, sanctified, forgiven, and free. I just feel in the Holy Ghost today that somebody just said to themselves, I've got to leave here free. These, these thoughts that have been tormenting my mind, I've got to leave here free. This addiction that I just can't seem to shake. I got to leave here free. Those, 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 those demons that have been visiting my life and tormenting me. I've got to be free. Can I tell you God's presence is here and available to you to set you free once and for all. If the pianist would come. I'm finished. The third and last thing. There's a call of God. To serve him in a time of crisis. The last verse, verse number 8 of Isaiah 6. I love this. This is what he says. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. The prophet Isaiah, after this amazing encounter with God, after this transforming touch of God's presence, he goes on to say, beside all that I experienced in God's presence, I mean, that would be enough for me. I don't know about you. I don't know if at that moment Isaiah couldn't even walk anymore. I mean, he probably would have been just prostrate, laid out on the floor of the temple. I don't know. But Isaiah says also, like after all that I experienced, after the Holy Ghost shaking that I just got, also I heard the voice of the Lord. What does this mean? Seeking God's presence will also cause you to hear his voice. Someone say his voice. This is also a reason why we're setting ourselves to seek the presence of God in this season here at PFAC. Because we want to hear his voice. There's some of us that got to make decisions. You just can't make an emotional decision. You can't even make a decision financially motivated. You got to make a decision led by the voice of God. And so Isaiah seeking God. He has this amazing encounter. God delivers him. God touches him. He sees angels flying. He sees the glory of God. And then he says, and also I heard the voice of the Lord. What, is, what does all this mean? Consecration opens your ears to God's voice. Consecration silences the rest of the voices around you. The voice of the flesh, the voice of the world, the voice of the devil. So that you can synchronize your ears to his voice. And then he says, I heard the voice of us and whom shall I send and who will go for us? There will always be a call of God in the midst of crisis. It was God's great question. Who can I send? Who will go? When you get into God's presence... You know what begins to happen? You begin to see the need around you. And there will be a call of God for you. In God's presence, there's a call for you to serve Him. If after consecration and prayer, you don't want to serve Him and do something for Him, let me tell you, you didn't do it right. Because prayer doesn't make you more spiritual. 
Prayer doesn't make you Lord over your spirituality over other people. Prayer draws you closer to God. Prayer causes you to surrender. Prayer causes you to say, Lord, I'll serve you in whatever way you want me to serve you. It's here many times where we give God our excuses. When God speaks to us, I don't have time. I'm dealing with too many problems right now. I need to focus on other things. I just don't think I can do what God is asking me to do. And we present all these excuses. And I define excuses very simply like this. Excuses are just creative reasons we've come up with for not doing what God is asking us to do. An excuse is just a creative reason that we've made up in our mind so that we don't have to obey what God is asking us to do. But I just feel like there's some folks in here that says, I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of trying to explain things away. If God is calling me to serve him, I'll serve him however he wants me to serve him. Seeking God, his presence should cause us to want to be the answer to God's questions. Stand with me. We have a great question, and now we have a great response. Somebody here like Isaiah needs to tell the Lord, you don't have to look anymore, Lord. Here I am. Send me. Somebody needs to be like Isaiah and say, I'm rearranging my priorities to make serving God my priority. That's what this season of prayer and consecration is here in this church. So that you and I could change some of our priorities. Because if you don't have time to pray, your priorities are out of order. If you don't have time for God, that means you got to get back and rearrange your list of priorities and put God at the very top and say, Lord, you're going to be my number one priority. You're going to be my number one focus. And then everything else will follow behind. God, here are my ideas. Here are my projects. I want to be the answer to God's question. Who will go? Who will I send? He says, here I am, send me. Did you know that the church is God's answer to the world's crisis? The answer for the world's crisis is not the United Nations. It's not the White House. It's not the same president or a different president. It's not the economy. It's not even the United States of America. The answer to our world's crisis is the church. The church has the answer. The answer's name is Jesus. And we have been positioned by God to tell people what you're looking for, you're only going to find in Jesus. What you're missing in your life is a relationship with Jesus. The church is God's answer presence of God in times of crisis changes you. So I wonder here today if there's somebody in this building that says, preacher, I need the presence of God in my life. I need the manifest presence of God. My life is messed up. My life is falling apart. I need his presence. Or there's somebody here that says, I've done all the above. But there's still one thing. There's still some things that I need to give to the Lord and surrender. The Lord is calling you today to seek his presence. Somebody that maybe has been already seeking the Lord but still hasn't taken that step to say, I'll serve you, God, wherever you want me and however you want me to serve you. And today God is calling you to seek his presence. I wonder if we could lift up our hands to heaven right now for a few moments.